Hello and welcome. This is the Mutiny Investing Podcast. This podcast features long form conversations on topics relating to investing, markets, risk, volatility, and complex systems. This is Jason Buck from the Mutiny Fund, and today I get to sit down with Chris Sidio, the CIO of Ambris Group. Um, Chris has a long history of working at different trading desks uh, throughout some different banks, then we'll get into the story of that. But today we're going to talk about all things volatility and all things options trading. Uh, we'll get in a little bit about how you set up you know, uh, cap short volatility to maybe fund some of your long volatility at the wings. We'll get into the different structural flows from non-economic hedgers and you know, all things that you know, everybody that follows Chris on Twitter loves all of his insights. So I think we should just dive right in. So Chris, let's Let's start with your background. What what got you into wanting to be, you know, a trader, and what's kind of your personal history? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, uh, started out during my college days. Um, I was really interested in uh, sports gambling. Uh, really funny that you know the two actually hold a pretty good correlation. Uh, had a pretty good math background. Was like a dirt in the math Olympiads and whatnot. Uh, so, tried to use applied statistics to uh, to actual sports gambling and didn't work out so well. <laughs> um, but uh, I got um, I got interested in the stock market, started trading the stock market. As like always, like with everybody, I had to pay my tuition, quote unquote, to the market and you know, lost some money there. Uh, but throughout the time, I, I think I learned a lot. And uh, from there, I went to work under one of the individuals who helped start the CBOE directly. So the guy was like a fall veteran, uh, basically trading fall for like 40 something years. Uh, and I was a sole junior. So, you know, I had a real good opportunity to learn under this individual and learn all the intricacies about trading ball. Um, it taught me a lot. And uh, from there, I went to uh, Chimera Securities, where I was on the uh, prop desk, um, learned a lot about trading institutional order flow and uh, some of the uh, moving parts that happened there. Uh, also, from there, I went to a small buy-side equity hedge fund. Um, they were more so focused on binary events and uh, also looking, in, in a way, it was somewhat like stat arb. Um, the way how they look to implement some of the uh, the, the moving factors. Uh, and then I spent most of my time at uh, BMO Capital Markets, about three and a half years there. Uh, most of my time there was on the exotic derivatives and listed options desk. And uh, I learned a ton there. Um, you know, I learned what it was like to look at a book from a holistic standpoint, You know, a really large book and all the idiosyncrasies about managing risk in a really big book and how to think about the market and all these moving parts. You know, like, Everybody talks about, you know, the fancy Greeks on, uh, you know, on Twitter, um, which, you know, I think uh, a lot of people uh, don't really understand the implications in some of these Greeks when, you know, you're managing a large book and you're thinking about risk in different buckets, whether it's, you know, your six month bucket, two year bucket, especially for like an exotics desk, you know, some of the longer dated stuff. Um, so I had the chance to learn on a lot of senior guys that, you know, showed me the ropes and uh, gave me a good understanding. Uh, and then from there, uh, I had the opportunity to uh, to leave and start up this Volar uh, hedge fund with uh, three of my partners. And uh, here we are, you know, uh, almost uh, about six months into it. And before we get back to Ambris, there's a part of your story that I was actually thinking about the other day, um, that when you were younger, you used to go down to uh, Wall Street and just stand outside of investment banks with your resume, hoping to catch some traders and like trying to just hustle on the street. And I think it's interesting, probably when you look at it now, you're like, that was a terrible move. There's no way that's ever going to happen. But the way I think about it is, is just hustling in general, right? Like there's a story that, that parents should always read to their kids. Like that's what's important for your kids, like uh, mental development. But what they found through studies is actually, if you're a parent that uh, has been educated and can afford the time to read to your kids at night, then your kids are going to be just fine. So it's more about their ability to have the economic uh, structure and the educational structure to be the ones that could read to their kids. It's not necessarily that they have to read to their kids. And I, I like that story that you had about putting out your, you know, standing on the street trying to hustle your resume is like, because you're somebody to hustle that hard, it wasn't going to work, but you're the kind of person that's going to do whatever it takes to make it work. I'm curious, like, how you think about that. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. I think, uh, you know, I think there's a part of that in trading um, where, you know, you have to have this the real set in determination to really follow through with it. Um, because, you know, when you're starting off, markets could break you. Um, you know, from all different angles, you know, it breaks the smartest of smartest individuals, especially if you have a math background, you know, you try to come in and use some math towards it. Uh, but yeah, that was, uh, that was definitely, uh, not a fun time, <laughs> but it was, it was good learning lessons. You know, um, I would basically head out there and you know, kind of 
in a weird way, stalk a guy on like LinkedIn and, you know, figure out, you know, which office he was at. And, and I just go out there with my hand, my hand extended and say, Hey, you know, good afternoon. My name is Chris Sidio. I have my track record with me. It's so funny because I thought they cared about a track record where they would see like, Oh yeah. You know, you return 60%. Like, you know, if somebody was to show me that these days, I'd just be like, Oh, this kid, you know? <laughs> so, so I, I get it. I get why they kind of just shoot me off. But, um, no, I think, uh, I think, you know, that, that hustle is something that uh, a lot of the younger, younger group kind of lacks today, as opposed to the wall street and, you know, like the eighties, like the old Salomon bros and uh, some of the Bear Stern stories and, um, some of that where guys were really hustling to, you know, get the job and had a real passion towards it. Yeah. It makes me think, I think it was like Taleb that talked about, you should look for the surgeon, like the ugly fat short surgeon or something with terrible hands. Like not, not the person that looks like a, like a perfect doctor because they've had it easy through life. Like that other dude had to like struggle and actually, uh, you know, outdo everybody to get to where he is. Um, it reminds me like, yeah, like you said, the old school Chicago days of those pit traders, it was more about like, what could you do? Not necessarily what school did you go to and what investment bank did you work at? And you had this, you know, golden path to get there, not taking anything away from those guys, but it's just a, it's a different way of, of, of of coming at the same problem and getting ahead. So you like you said, you just mentioned that, you know, within the last year, you guys decided to get together and la- launch Ambrus. What was the general thesis besides wanting to go out on your own? Yeah. So, you know, it, it really wasn't about uh, branching off. You know, I think a lot of people, when they, they talk to me, they think of me as like, you know, very entrepreneurial that, you know, I, I went off and I made this move, but uh, I didn't really care about, oh, you know, I'm working for somebody under a bank or anything like that. It was more so opportunity. Um, you know, my partners and I all collectively viewed the changing market microstructure. And we, we looked at some of the moving dynamics and we said to ourselves, there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, and, you know, with all the experience that, you know, I learned throughout the years with being on the buy side. And then, like I said, you know, being on the sell side and learning and understanding how to manage a book uh, of that size, you know, I think it really all lined up, uh, you know, for the correct moment to really jump. You know, my partners bring a ton of experience to the table as well. And one of my partners, uh, he had a market making firm in Chicago. He sold it for you know hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, you know, so I think it was just one of these things that it just lined up completely due to the environment that the market was giving us. Uh, and I just didn't want to let that opportunity go to waste. And can you define by what you mean when you say you view the changes in the market microstructure? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> the market right now, if you look at what the market is currently doing, uh, it's completely different to the market that you see in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. One month variance on uh, single name equities have increased tremendously. Um, and, you know, I think everybody who's trading it kind of understands this, right? Everybody is like, wow, equities just won't stop going up. Or, you know, equities, uh, you know, it's it's buy buy stocks because that's all it does right the upward drift in in u.s equities um you know when we're going through certain back tests and uh, things of that nature there the environments are just two completely different things right and i i'm very openly uh i'm, I'm very outspoken about this you know when you're doing a back test i think post 2017 you have to look at a back test from a completely different angle and you have to weight it more uh you have to weight heavier post 2017 than you would the data pre 2017 because of all these moving parts and, and, and the change of the market. That's, re- that's really interesting. Cause I even think about even general volatility trading. Everybody's like, can you back test this to like uh 1900? I'm like, no, we can't. I wouldn't even trust the back test pre 2010. And then you're, you're even moving up that timeline to 2017. Like, what do you think was uh, really the baseline of that shift in 2017? <sighs> Yeah. So, you know, this is a, this is the big beast where we're going to just go, we're going to dive straight forward into it. Um, You know, a lot has changed to really add to that uh, one month variance in U S equities. The first moving part is obviously the growth of derivatives, right? Derivative exposure is at all time highs. If you're, you know, anything about vol, you've heard, you know, these gamma squeezes and vanna squeezes, right? The reflexivity of the market, which is, it's, it's really true and it's prominent. Um, you know, but outside of the listed option space, what a lot of people tend to forget is in a low rate environment, this is happening in the exotics world just as well, right? It, U.S. Uh, U.S. exotics is more so a smaller market than the rest of the world, but the same way that the dealer needs to hedge off the risk that adds to a form of reflexivity, 
to the overall, the, the, well, the underlying, it's the same thing that goes on uh, in the exotics world, right? So you have listed options, which is adding to this reflexivity. Then you have exotic structures, which is, by the way, it's having an, an amazing, you know, two years, right? Everybody wants exotic notes. Uh, every financial advisor is putting their clients in some sort of exotic structure, right? So banks are just printing these things, right? right hot off the press. And they need to hedge off the book. Um, outside By exotic of- structures, do you mean like uh, European and Asian structured products or other exotics? Oh, well, just here in the U.S., right? Let's, let's think solely in the U.S. I mean, the exotics... Uh, the structured products world is is extremely big uh, outside of the U.S. The U.S. is is you know relatively small small in comparison to the rest of the world. Uh, but yeah, you know most of these exotic notes in the U.S. are tied to uh, you know some of the indexes like um, of SPX. You know you'll have uh, some tech stuff, uh, even single names, right? You'll have like a worst of Phoenix Auto Callable. With a barrier at like seventy five percent or something like that, that's tied to like three tech names, which could be you know Apple, Tesla, Amazon. You know I'm going to make you define a a knock in Phoenix Auto Callable on on tech names, so you're going to have to break <laughs> that one down. <laughs> okay, so basically, how you have to think about this is, uh, you have to think about it as a knock in put, right? So what happens is, uh, the bank structures the note. They price the note, they issue the note to the client, and it would be like, you know, a really large institution. Um, I'm not going to say any names or whatnot, but the large institution takes this and what it does is it now packages it and gives it to the financial advisors. The financial advisors sell it off to the clients. Basically what it is, it's like, think of three names. Let's think of like Tesla, Apple, Amazon, right? And what it's doing, it's pricing in, you know, like, let's just say a one-year note. The worst of the worst performing of those notes, right? And where it's going to be at. So if you have a barrier note that struck at 75%, right? Basically, when it gets to 75%, the note knocks in, right? So let's just say you have like Tesla is, you know, the worst performing, which is probably not going to be true. <laughs> but um, let's say, you know, Tesla's the worst performing and it's down. Right, even though Apple and Amazon are soaring, just because that Tesla uh, stock is underperforming and it hits that barrier, well, now you know the dealer needs to hedge off the risk, and now basically the client loses on the trade. Right. So if you're the client, you're clipping a yield. You're getting some sort of a yield, whether it's you know they'll probably price the note somewhere along the lines of like nine percent annual yield, twelve. Well, probably for tech, maybe like 15 percent annual yield. Uh, so the client receives a yield, and basically they are short a downside put, which the bank is long. And it makes it uh, a little more difficult the more you do these baskets of worse off for the, actually the, the dealers to hedge that risk or the bank to hedge that risk, right? Because if you have three different stocks going in three different directions or three different volatilities, and then you're moving maybe down towards that strike, um, it makes it a little more difficult for them to hedge that in, in real time, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think... Uh, I, I think there are many different ways that uh, banks look at the risk, and this goes down to the risk model that they have in house. Um, you know, I've seen different ways that people price these things, and you know, there's been times where people will structure it and go to a bank, and uh, you know, their pricing on it is way off of what you know the the, the client had or something of that form. Uh, and yeah, absolutely, when you're thinking about risk, um, you know, you have to price in. The, the moving parts of three things and, you know, the probability assumption, whether you're running a million Monte Carlo simulations or whatnot. So it could be a lot, it could be very difficult. And, you know, when, when they print these notes, you're generally printing a big notional, you know, so you're, you have to make sure that that big notional to the downside is, is hedged off. And then what's interesting is what I always found, it's like an inverted parabola kind of of hedging is like they're hedging as they're moving down towards that strike. But then when they're getting closer to the strike, they know that the client's going to get, you know, knocked in or knocked out of that contract. So then they start taking off their hedges once, you know, it hits that that, that 75% range. Yeah. You know, it could be a, it could be a tricky thing based on some of the other moving parts of, of, uh, of the book. You know, uh, some banks didn't do as well as you would think that they would and should have done. Um, in an environment like, you know, March of 20, where a lot of these notes are, are getting knocked in and the client is kind of, you know, losing money on it. And, and what tends to happen sometimes, too, uh, is you'll have buybacks, right? So what you'll have is 
a client will basically get the note, right? And they'll be happy with the note or whatnot like that. Uh, and then let's say it doesn't fit their portfolio. They want to now basically sell it to the bank. Now, when the bank prices that, I'm telling you, when you're on the exotic side, right? When you're on the OTC side, the bank is going to price that very favorable to themselves. Uh, you know, that's, that's, a, that's, that's the thing. A lot of the institutions, after they issue the note, right, it's fair game. And a lot of times, some banks don't want to buy back notes from other banks that were issued off, right? So you'll have a bank and, you know, let's just say Goldman Sachs, or you know, I'm just putting this out there, right? I don't know anything about Goldman Sachs exotic desk, but could be a process where they're like, okay, we're only buying back our notes. We don't want to buy back, you know, the notes from out there. So the liquidity in the market, you know, at times can be, uh, it can be brutal for some of the clients who, who are taking some of the stuff down. And two more things about those auto callables. And then as I interrupted your flow of the micro, micro structures and we'll get back to it is like, you know, people don't realize a lot of times those, those auto callables, if it's negative 25% down, let's say for the worst off, well, you miss the drift maybe before March. So it's it's the actual vintage of when it was struck. So if it was struck in January and the market drift up 10% and they're like, well, we sold up, well, it never got touched. So a lot of those things didn't get touched. So they're all still sitting out there. Maybe they did some buybacks and rip people's faces off. But to your point too, is that part of it too, is like people go, well, that's all OTC and that's, that's, that's counterparty risk and everything. But a lot of times they're hedging in the liquid market. So that's what you have to pay attention to those flows. Is that the way you see it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the majority of the hedging is done on the listed option side, right? Uh, that's, that's where the majority of uh, the hedging is going to take place. Now it varies when, you know, you're, you're striking structured product notes that are like five years out, right? Which is, is a, is a common thing. You know, they, they, you do have a lot of these notes that are struck, you know, long dated, um, but yeah, most of the people are, are most of, uh, most of the hedges are coming through on the uh, listed option side. Um, and back to your point, which you were saying about the market drifting up, that's absolutely a, a true thing. And what's super interesting is that financial advisors remember, you know, they, they don't really have a great understanding as to what's going on in the market. Right. So when you have a huge institution comes in and takes down these notes from a bank that structures them. The financial advisors just want to push them to the clients, right? So if you're a client and you're striking one of those notes right now when the market is at like all time highs, right? It could be, it could be brutal. It could be very brutal for you. Um, you know, so I think you as a client, you have to also be aware of, you know, what are the actual market conditions? Where is the market priced at right now? Because uh, me personally, I wouldn't be too enthusiastic about pricing a worst of, you know, tech note. Uh, that has a 25%, you know, barrier or whatnot. That's two years out, me personally. And I and I interrupt you, but I think about like uh, the rise of dirt in the markets is really a 20 year timeline to, to really reach maturity that we're at now. And it may have taken a hit a little bit in 2008, but like you said, now we're seeing like this is the tail wagging the dog and the derivative market so huge because we we push people out the risk curve and people are searching for yield, so they start to get into uh, you know selling volatility and options and then even more exotic derivatives like structured products because they're just trying to give clients yield that they're so accustomed to that they found in you know treasuries or duration prior to. Um, is there anything else you think since 2017 that's really, really changed that market microstructure before we move on to, you know, what you guys do? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, this is not only 2017, but I think from a regulatory standpoint, and I know you and I have spoken about this before, and, you know, I've been pretty outspoken about this, but uh, the implementation of Dodd-Frank, uh, I think was pretty big. And I think, you know, pre-2008, if you were a dealer, you know, and you had a position in your book that was going against you, you could take down more risk, right? You say, hey, I want to take down more risk, you know, hold off. I'm warehousing the position. That's what, you know, you would call it. I'm inventorying the position, warehousing it. Uh, a funny thing that goes on on the, uh, the sell side, it's a famous saying that, you know, you're in the moving business. In the move, so don't, don't warehouse the position. But again, prior to 2008, you could warehouse the position. But now, you know, moving forward, you know, post 2008 and, and whatnot, we're in an, we're in an environment where uh, the regulatory implications are so uh, strict for some of these larger institutions that it creates the reflexivity to start the cascading effect, right? So if you are a trader and you have a position that's going against you, uh, basically, you know, you'll get that tap on the shoulder from risk to say, hey, what's going on? You know, where are your overnight risk levels at? Uh, you know, I think, you know, you need to hedge that off, right? And 
when the dealer now goes into the market to hedge that off, right, it starts the cascading effect. So it's that reflexive cascading effect, uh, which could be pretty big. I also think, you know, which is a very evident factor uh, that the market participants are changing. You know, we're hearing so much about uh, how millennials look at the market. Uh, and I think there's a big transition of the, um, you know, the the actual buying power in the market that's being driven from millennials. And, you know, people have to understand, millennials think in a growth speculative type of way. I'm a millennial. I will tell you straightforward, right? Like majority of millennials are looking for a home run type of play. You know, I view markets differently than they do, but you have to understand a lot of these individuals are now, you know, lawyers, doctors, right? They are now like practitioners in their field that are well-respected and they have wealth um, and they want to put that to work and they're not afraid to do that in a speculative manner. And what makes this so different than 2001, when people try to make the comparison to 2001, um, you know, you look at the accessibility to this market, it's completely different. Anybody could just pick up a phone and, and, you know, open up a brokerage account and just start trading. And not only is the accessibility easy, but you also have the factor that the educational standpoint has now become super accessible, right? So for like in that 2001 environment, you didn't have a million people on YouTube trying to train people how to trade right now. Somebody can open up a brokerage account to say, Hey, it's open. And then they'll go look at some guy who says, Hey, I'm going to show you how to trade on YouTube. And it gives them the conviction to be in that position. Right. Even if it's if, if it's complete garbage, they now have the conviction to say, I'm going to buy into that. Right. I, I believe in this. Right. So the accessibility the teaching, it just leads to more increased variance. Um, you know, and then you talk about uh, which, you know, which is Mike Green's big topic, you know, the, the this transition into passive. Right. Some of these ETP, uh, ETF products that are being created um, and the way how they're structured. Right. Everybody wants a form of diversification. And it's that reach for diversification is actually leading to a lack of diversification. You look at, you know, if you, if you think about a dispersion trade in the Qs and, and, and SPX, and I was telling this to my partner and I, I, I've been kind of outspoken on this as well. It's like no point in, in buying, you know, vols on, on the Qs. You might as well just do it in SPY or, you know, SPX because you look at the core names that are in there. Right. They're large tech names, Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, right? All tech, all huge components in the market. Right. So the reach for diversification has now actually led for a lack of diversification where these large tech names are leading the path. Right. They're leading the path completely uh, and driving the market. Well, let's let's break down that dispersion trade real quick. Um, just, you know, for the audience. Describe the classic dispersion trade and then how you alluded to now, if it's only really five names, it's not really, uh, you're not really getting that index dispersion, like your, your dispersion is, is kind of gone away. Or how do you think about dispersion? Yeah. So the way how we express dispersion trading is a little bit different. And, you know, we'll, we'll go into that you when know, we talk about like the firm philosophy. Uh, but your standard dispersion trade will be something where you'll, you know, sell a straddle um, on uh, the, uh, an ETF or an index basically, right. You sell the straddle, uh, and then Delta weighted or Vega weighted, you're going to buy the straddle on the components inside, right? So what you're hoping for is a pure vol move where you have, uh, a Vega expansion from the constituencies in there, uh, in relation to the actual ETF or the index. So you're hoping that all the little, you know, let's say five names that you buy, the vol expands there. And the vol that you're short in the index or the ETF doesn't move too much. And then, how do you think about that that correlation change if we're down to only like maybe five names in an index or really moving that flow weighted index? Yeah, uh, it's a it's a you know it's a big factor. I mean, if you look at the way how uh, implied correlation has been, um, you know, since November, it's been pretty much pinned down. You know, uh, uh, it's it's something that I think a lot of people need to think about um, because I think. Again, you know, we're moving into an environment where things are becoming much more tied um, than they generally are. And people are trading on uh, data and, and, and a, a market that is no longer the same. Um, I mean, just moving away from that real fast, like you even look at what took place in, uh, in, in March where you had bonds down, equities down. Right. You're seeing a lot 
of those, you know, the inverse correlation break, which means that, you know, it's a positive correlation, right? So things are becoming much more tied together, um, even though it may seem like, okay, you know, implied correlation is pinned down or whatnot. I don't believe that's true. And I think in true risk off events, we will see more of those where, you know, you have that dynamic that everything is coming down with it. I mean, you even think about the whole Bitcoin thing. And, you know, this is a point that I, I had kind of brought up where when Tesla must now says, OK, yeah, we're bringing on Bitcoin in, you know, on our balance sheet. Well, is sentiment now going to change to say that, OK, Bitcoin to Tesla correlations are going to be in line? And by the way, Tesla is a part of SPX. Right. So is that correlation going to be in line? Right. So in a real risk off event, we have that dynamic where Bitcoin's down, Tesla's down spies down you know like everything's down with it and i think things are becoming much more tied together so it, it's it's a it's a point of concern um i think uh if you are you know a, a, a money manager yeah it's like if your short correlation in those classic trades you can just get your face ripped off in 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 these liquidity cascades of these markets to quote Corey hofstein as well but i also want to push back before we get it good ahead when you said, you know, millennials are really long growth or they're happy to take these YOLO trades and they're making money. Let's be honest. That's just youth, right? As, as, a, as a Gen Xer, I hate to be an old man voice of reason, but it's always been youth, right? Like you said, back in 99, I was, you know, YOLOing in my E-Trade e account on, on tech names. But it's, it's the same thing. Youth, we always want to get ahead. We want to stick it to our parents. We want to get rich quick. So it's, it's like we always kind of that's, – that's kind of a uh, – it's, it's the story of life, right? Just as, just as unfortunately the story of life is the old like to disparage to the young. You know, I'm not playing that game either. It's like, I get it, go for your, get yours, you know, but we all learn from those mistakes, hopefully over time. And, you know, we, we suck less hopefully over time, but it's a, uh, it's not necessarily millennials versus boomers. It's more just like the young versus the old. And this is a perennial story. Um, yeah, no, unless you want to push back. Yeah, no, I, I think there's a good amount of transfer of wealth as well. You know, um, I think, especially when you look at a low rate environment, right? Where a lot of millennials could just say, I'm going to borrow cash. Right. And I know people who have done that where, you know, they're borrowing cash and they're also using some cash that they have to put towards, uh, you know, equities. Um, because technically there's no other place to park money right now. Right. You know, you know, buy treasury, right. Which is, you know, contrary to your standard portfolio breakdown where, which it once was, I mean, man, I, I know, you know, a few guys at large banks that I'm, I'm pretty, pretty friendly with that are, you know, just freshly became a director level that are like, hey, man, I have a couple hundred thousand that I just kind of want to just put to work. Um, you know, I think I think that that wealth and that actual savings is, is much more different this time around. And I think the appetite is just very different with this generation. But, you know, we have and a different... No, but you're also de dead right on the education piece too. Is like when in '99 there was no online messages or videos telling me how to uh, operate a gamma squeeze. So the education level is at a whole new level, whether they they get it or not. It's just it, yeah, the the education level is shocking that people are you know figuring out the at least somebody in the crew is figuring out the market microstructure and how to how to squeeze dealers. I mean, it's it really is fascinating at the end of the day. But let's let's get back to Ambrus and you guys have primarily two strategies. Um, that really complement each other, actually. But let's let's maybe start with the yield strategy and 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 what that entails. Yeah, so we break the book down um, into a few different subcomponent sleeves. But the main way that you know you should look at the book is we decided to like segregate them into two forms. One is the yield strategy, uh, which focuses on a cap short vega type of book, uh, and then the other strategy is the convexity uh, fund where we have our long gamma, long vega profile, which is also being funded by some cap short vega in there. Um, and, you know, I just want to give a, a little bit of the listeners uh, an idea as to how we view markets as a whole. Um, a lot of what we do is predicated around chaos theory, which, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, wow, you know, complex math, but it's not, you know, we're not, we're not looking to implement Lorenz attractors into every single factor in the model. You know, we're looking at markets from this lens, whereas, Humans naturally underestimate the potential distribution of outcomes at levels of extremity. And what I mean by that is that at those, you know, 99 percentile ranges, when things go two sigma, people say, no, you know, this can't go four sigma. And because they look to fade that 
it reflexively contributes to a five sigma or six sigma event. We are the guys on the other side that are looking at that and we're saying, okay, at this level of extremity, you know, ball guys look to look at like to look at things in percentile terms, you know, so the 99 percentile range or the one percentile range. We like to be at that point where we are focusing at that point uh, on positional imbalances and we try to remain agnostic to market direction. So what I mean by that is that we like to play way, way out the money wings. So we focus on a form of kurtosis trading both ways. So skew trading, the right of the market and the left of the market. Um, but to go back to what you were saying, you know, focusing on the yield book, uh, the yield book specifically, uh, the reason why we cap the Vega is because of our firm philosophy, where we believe that in these scenarios, people underestimate the potential and you can have that six sigma event happen to you overnight. So we don't ever carry any short Vega in the book that is not capped, where we know that, okay, if the market you know, was to tank and let's say VIX goes to a million, we know where our loss will be at. Right? It's not like to say we have a calendar spread on where we're getting our face ripped off you know, from, uh, from gamma basically ripping our faces off. Um, it's more so we have a defined point which we carry in the book. We're looking at certain strategies where we could harvest the VRP and also the roll yield in the VIX futures term structure. Um, and we're capturing that to help fund the wings on the other side. And just to give us like a, a toy model, because like you said, um, you know, you don't want to take any basis risk, especially on a calendar risk basis. But how in, in essence could you could you set up a cap to Vega trade um, without, you know, diving too much into the details as far as like, you know, to make sure that spread doesn't get blown out or, you, you, you know, there's other ways you can get pinned or get your face ripped off. So like maybe just a generic example of what you how you view a cap Vega trade. Yeah. So, I, you know, I think this is a big misconception that I. I I really want to address people take structures for strategy. And what I mean by that is people will say, Hey, I'm going to, you know, sell an iron condor or I'm going to sell a call spread. That is not a strategy. That is a structure, right? You have no edge. And if, if I just synthetically come out and I say, I'm just going to sell a call spread, right? There is no edge in doing that at all. People have a bad misunderstanding where they think that that's a strategy, Right. So what we do is we will analyze the data where we believe we have some sort of a statistical edge and we will implement a structure in that avenue. Right. And what I mean by that, for example, you know, the VIX futures term structure, there are times where we are looking to take advantage of the roll yield there. Right. So some of the ETP products, right, you could basically uh, capture some of that short Vega and some of the, the ETP products that decay at a pretty fast rate. Um the way how we express that is by selling call spreads, right? A capped call spread. Some people will just sell naked calls or you know, some people will just short the front month futures just straight out outright. Um, you know, but that's a way that you could express that. The same way how, let's say you, you, come, you come with some sort of assumption that, okay, the market in a specific range at a specific time frame or you know, whatever signal you may have, doesn't go under this level, right? I'm just saying, I'm just making something up. And you want to sell a put. Instead of selling a naked put, we, we would sell like a put spread, right? So every type of trade that we take is a risk-defined trade. And so you brought up VRP, which is volatility risk premium. And there's kind of like, and you alluded to two ways to look at that, but I just want to highlight both, is a lot of times people think of the difference between implied and realized. But the other way to look at it is actually the term structure premia of the roll down yield, the roll up yield if you're in backwardation. Um, how do you look at that at VRP as volatility risk premium? Are you primarily, like you said, trying to capture the roll yield or do you even play the implied versus realized game? So we're more so looking at the roll yield uh, for the VIX futures term structure. Um, there's, you know, there's many ways that we analyze it, um, but more so we're trying to harvest uh, the, the roll yield there. We're looking at for single name equities. Uh, we're focused on the VRP, right? So it could be some sort of an edge in a binary event where we think, you know, single name equities, the vault pricing may be out of whack and, you know, we look to target it there. Um, but the way how we look at some of the vault ETPs is in a different thought process, in a different frame. 
Um, you know, it's, and there was a very good article uh, written by Vance Harwood on the misconception that individuals have with understanding the ETPs and the cotangle that decays it. Right? And his point was that it is not the cotangle, it is the convergence between uh, the, the two front month futures to VIX itself. Um, and he had some data in there. I would highly suggest, you know, the, some of the listeners check it out uh, because I thought it was a great write up. And, you know, that's that's the way how we look at it. Right. It's not about that cotangle number specifically. Um, it's more so about that convergence between, uh, you know, the the spread difference between the front month futures and you know, spot fix. Well, and like you said, too, there's there's uh, there's structures and strategies. And a lot of people then just try to capture that roll down yield in a systematic way, just always putting on the trade. But like you said, there's a there's a convergence of whether it's coming up or down or meeting in the middle, but also there's there's kind of bellies of that move. And I assume that's what you're like algorithmically trying to time, like more of the sweet spot of that move as well. Yeah. Yeah. So we have uh, we have different ways that, you know, we look at these uh, these things. I don't believe, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just a, a believer against in doing things in a completely systematic type of way. I don't think markets offer opportunities like that. There are uh, many different environments and regimes where you could pull out certain tools that you have in the toolbox, but I don't think every strategy could just be fit into every market. And, you know, I think a lot of people just try to approach it that way, which, you know, if you're a huge pension fund or, you know, a tremendously large fund of fund, and you're trying to do something uh, in relation to something else, I get it. But, you know, if you're a money manager and you're trying to outperform in a way, I don't think things should be done systematically, especially vol selling. That's like the number one thing that I don't think should be done. I mean, a perfect example would be how some of, uh, you know, how some of the vol products have been acting when, when VIX is on this quote unquote VIX floor, right? We talk about this, this 20 VIX being the new VIX floor. Um, you know, you haven't had that massive uh, fall apart in some of the ETPs, Um you know, prior to the the, the last uh, last week and a couple few days before, it's been very very rock solid uh, at these levels. So you know, if you were just systematically saying, "Yeah, I'm just going to go and I'm just going to you know sell calls on ETPs or just short front month futures," or it, it, it just doesn't work that way. I just want to timestamp that today is uh, we're recording on Thursday, February 18th. So when you're talking about recently and everything, people can just, you know, <laughs> yep, yep. exactly what you're talking about, just in case they're listening to this like two years from now or something. Um, so thinking about selling that capped Vega, how do you also think about uh, the the tenor or duration of those trades? Do you think about the the time preferences differently than you think about on the convexity side? Uh, no. And uh, I'll give you a, I'll give you a good reasoning as to why. Um, a lot of people who are larger allocators, you know, when we go to speak with them, they ask us, well, why not play six month vol or three month vol? Uh, and it goes against our firm belief. Um, you know, we believe that due to this market microstructure, you'll see increased variance in short dated timeframes. It could be very difficult to time that if you're playing three month vol or six month vol. Maybe you'll land right in the middle, right? Maybe that six month vol is going to turn into one month vol the month that things blow up. Uh, but the way how we like to look at things is in a short dated time frame. Um, we look at our long Vega, long Gamma stuff within like one month to one and a half months. Because if you look at the crux of the moves that have taken place, again, in this post-2017 regime, Volmageddon, December of 2018, uh, COVID of 2020, all these moves just fall apart in about a month, a month and a, two weeks or so. Right. So we like to position ourselves on that monthly base, which for us, it means, you know, more trading, more reweighting the book, uh, more reallocating. But that's how we trade. We trade flow when we look to spot positional imbalances in the U.S. equity market and these areas where we find the positional imbalances, we look to allocate towards it. We'll say, OK, here's a good avenue for us to you know, fund a ton of wings. We could buy a lot of gamma. Um, effectively, that's what we are. We are gamma hogs that are just trying to play skew you know we're looking we're the guys that are buying those two delta calls two delta puts that everybody's like who's the idiot that's buying this well that's us we're on the other side right so we're taking our short vega stuff that we're winning on and we're funding our long gamma stuff um that we're hoping to have that type of explosive action and again you know this is not just to the downside because of the increased variance in u.s equities 
we believe that you will continue to see these large rallies to the upside, um, more so due to the market microstructure. You know, these these imbalances and some of these flows that cause the positional dislocations, it's here to stay um, until, you know, you have an environment where uh, rates aren't pinned to the ground or there's some sort of regulatory intervention. You will continue to see the market make these very sharp moves up and down, up and down. Uh, so that's why we more so focused on the short dated time frame, um, even though, you know, there are opportunities that arise with, you know, three month fall, six month fall. We'll see uh, ways that we could look at the term structure and say, hey, you know, that looks good. But again, it, it's not it's not what we do specifically. We're looking for uh, the most gamma that we could possibly obtain. And I want to highlight a few things before we move on to the convexity side of the book that you touched on, um, you know, when you talk about flows and positional imbalances, and I'll take it back to chaos theory. I'm glad you defined your definition of it because chaos theory tends to be a catch-all, like saying, I think from first principles, I'm like, great, well, what does that mean to you? And so uh, let me say it back to you, what I think you said, just so I, I can clarify is that um, when you think about chaos theories, when you have a, a, a two or three sigma move, um, you can then look at the flows, the non-economic players, and the position balances or imbalances to determine, is this going to be mean reversionary from here, or are we going to break out to a five or six sigma move? And is that how you think about the, the chaos either feeds on itself, but you're really looking at the flows or the positional imbalances at inflection points? Is that fair? Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to look at it as well. Um, but, you know, I think one frame, and it's a very easy way to look at this, is that when there's smoke, there's fire. Right. And when you're at a level of extremity, you could kind of bank on the fact that there's going to be more of that. Right. Naturally, people are going to say, OK, we're now in the 99 percentile range. It has to come down. But that thought process, it adds to the reflexivity to, to turn it into a Six Sigma event. Right. And this happened during COVID. I mean, I could give you guys a perfect example. Right. When COVID first came about, you notice the market started to tank and, uh, you know, that. Uh, I would say third week of February, fourth week of February. But what were people doing? They were selling more Vega. Nobody was covering Vega at that point, right? And it just added to this huge, added fuel to the fire that led to this massive blow up, right? And you, even a GME, right? We could use this 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 uh, basic saying to every large outlier event in the market. GME, right? When GME was at like seventy, people were like, "There's no way it could go to 100. There's no way it could go to 200, no way it could go to 300, no way it could go to 400, right? And the reflexivity just continues to drive it. Um, so I think the way how we look at it is that when you have things that are at extreme levels where you see large positional imbalances or dislocations, you know, where let's just say, for example, we're looking at the small, right? And we notice that, you know, the smile is now, you know, let's say 80% moneyness is now trading, you know, in the 99 percentile range. Most people will say, okay, that's rich. We're selling that. We're not viewing it in that sense. We're saying that, hey, can we check the flows there? Can we check where some of the prints were at? Can we see you know, what was done there? Do we know if there are any players that are, have been you know, specifically targeting that? What is the reason for that? Right? And our thought process is we don't want to step in front of that. We would probably be wanting to buy something like that. Um, you know, the, the very, very cheap gamma that, that we could buy in an area where we think, OK, maybe there is a dislocation there. Um, so it's just a different frame of thinking, you know, contrary to your standard mean reverting type of way of thinking. You know, this is this is not the market where you want to be playing, you know, mean reverting uh, type of price action on a you know, one to two week time frame. It's like when the market is trending, it is going to trend in one direction on a short dated time frame and more so rip your face off. It was funny. I was thinking about when you're saying GME, no way it can go to hundred, no way it can go to 200, no way it can go to 400. It's like, were you talking about the price or the vol? <laughs> Cause like at that time, <laughs> for, the, for those weird, rare times in life, we saw both at like the, the same levels almost, you know, like vol 700, you know, it was, it was insane. Right. Yeah. I think it got to a, th I know AMC got to, I was looking at the AMC ball, the AMC had the money, like one month out, got to like a thousand ball. It was another thing, you know, it's like, well, tell me the difference between a 700 vol and a thousand ball, right? <laughs> like, there's no difference in it. So, before we get to convexity book, you, you kind of hinted at it already that you like to, to buy those teenies, but like you talk about, you don't do it in a systematic way. You know, you're looking for your, your spots, you're picking your spots, but also can you define what, you know, long skew or long kurtosis is? 
Yeah, so there's a lot of different uh, definitions, and there's many ways that people could think about playing uh, you know, long skew and long kurtosis. I think the easiest way to, to bring to viewers is that we're looking to just buy wings, right? So again, you know, think of think of us as the guys that are buying that five delta call, five delta puts, where you know we're allocating a certain amount of VAR towards it, and we're saying, hey, we want the most convexity here. We want uh, you know that vol smile to pick up. We you know when when you know, the name is going down, the vol smile is picking up, right? The Vegas picking up, the gamma is picking up. And we're getting paid out like 50 to 1, 100 to 1 uh, on the initial trade. That's what interests us. We're fine with, you know, dropping, uh, losing on the majority of these because that's how it goes. The majority of the time is you're going to miss on about, uh, you know, a good amount. I would say about 70, 80 percent of the trades you're going to miss on these. But when you hit, you're going to hit very big. And as long as you could fund that cost of carry with, you know, the stuff that you do statistically on the short Vegas side, because again, the correct side of the trade to be on statistically is short Vega. I think every vol trader will tell you that statistically the short Vegas side pays. But if you really want to make that, um, that substantial gain, it doesn't come from the short Vegas side. It comes from the, the convexity side. Uh, but you know, people, express the short Vegas side incorrectly. So, you know, their PL looks like this. They make money, make money, make money, and the risk isn't defined. And then they give it all back when the move happens. Whereas if you could do this in a structured, defined way, you know, where you find an edge and you figure out, okay, is there an edge here? I could have some sort of defined risk where I'm capping the risk and I'm short Vega, I'm short Vega, I'm short Vega, oh, draw down, and I'm short Vega, short Vega, short Vega, and you're going back. I think about it. Um Historically, you know, I, I grew up reading like the Market Wizards books, right? And those those CTAs are long divergence, right? They're looking for breakouts. And so they would say these are target rich environments for divergent traders. And then when we're in a convergent or mean reverting environment, we get hurt. And I was always like, why wouldn't you just do both then? You know, and that's what like you're talking about is like, you want to be on that breakout side, but naturally, you know, you want to be um, on, on the divergent trades on those wings. But you realize to fund that, you need to have some cap vega. So you're agnostic to short ball, long ball. But how do you think about a lot of people can get blown out that way. So how do you think about, you know, when you combine the two, how do you position size, maybe the short vega side while maybe, you know, losing on all those options on the wings, but being able to survive? Yeah. So that breaks down to environment. And this is where we get into a little of the proprietary stuff. Um, you know, some people, uh, you, you can't completely just data weight it. Uh, I think you remove a lot of the edge there. Um, you know, it, it goes completely different than you just, you know, selling a straddle and buying the, the uh, constituencies in the straddle, you know, Vega weighted. It doesn't really work that simple. I think it comes down to the practitioner's forecast and them having a forecast and an understanding, okay, can I take, you know, some sort of P&L from this pocket of the book and dump it into this bucket, you know, where I'm long gamma, long Vega, um, there's different ratios that you could, you know, carry on your book at a certain time where you say, okay, you know, maybe I want to be, I don't know, five to one gamma to theta or, you know, vice versa. Maybe there's an environment where you're like, you know what, the vol is just very rich here. I should be leaned, um, you know, heavier long theta in my book because uh, with vol being so high, right? Obviously as vol increases, gamma is going to decrease, right? You're not going to get that convexity and you're probably not going to get paid out. So you're probably looking at it and you're saying to yourself, yeah, let me you know, uh, up some of that, uh, that, that carry. So I'll be long more theta in the book. Um, whereas maybe in an environment where vol starts to get pinned down, you may be saying to yourself, you know what? Gamma is really cheap here. I'm going to load up on some excess gamma and maybe I'll fund some stuff, you know, four weeks out, you know, a month out for the people who are playing, you know, the entire term structure three months out, six months out, whatever. Uh, it's different environments that go, and you know, you have to adjust as a as a practitioner, as a trader, to to fit those environments as you go. And then, as you referenced before, you're not just systematically or willy nilly buying all these teenies and just loading up on inventory because it's cheap. Mm -hmm. but, you know, how do you think about searching out for those 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 points that you want to be buying? You know, <clears throat> those two to five delta, you know, puts and calls. Right. So <clears throat> one big thing, you know, in how we look at the book, obviously we have certain band-aids to our allocators. So we need to make sure that the downside's protected, right? And also the upside's protected. So there are some things that we need to make sure that we're we're funding in the book, but we look at special situations as a as a as a good point of focus where 
we could see like an earnings event coming up, right? We'll notice a dislocation. Hey, why is the term structure moved, uh, you know, so much in this earnings in comparison to last earnings? Why was the flow so strong this time around? Do we know if there was, you know, a large pension fund that's been buying, you know, flow at a, this specific level? Do we know that, you know, there's a large player that, you know, keeps coming back to the market? Maybe we see them on the tape, you know, maybe we spot something, right? So it's really understanding positional imbalances and saying, okay, could there be a catalyst behind it, right? And I think when you're a long vault trader, the same way how you would run like, you know, a jump diffusion model uh, when, you know, you're you're basically like calibrating balls or whatnot, you got to look at that and say, well, I probably want to be on that side of it, right? In a scenario where the vaults are going to potentially jump, I probably want to be there. And uh, you know, this is something that I learned from, uh, you know, a senior guy, and again, you know, I'm really grateful I had the opportunity to learn under all those guys because these are these little things that you learn where it's like, when you're a long fall guy, you should be focused on areas that offer a potential catalyst, right? It's going to give you that opportunity as opposed to you just buying dead vault. You know, that regime where you're like, yeah, I'm just going to buy cheap realize because it's just so super cheap. It's just not going to work. You're just going to bleed on out. You have to have something behind that uh, for you to take that trade, contrary to you just saying, I'm just buying vol and I'm, you know, I'm just buying it because it's it's dirt cheap. Now we have a view on certain things. Um, you know, there's certain sectors in the book where we think this is pretty cheap. And, you know, in a sell-off, we think the, you know, the beta in relation to the rest of what the market is going to be doing and the correlation is going to be much stronger. So we'll, you know, we'll buy those things as well. But focusing on, on some of the special situation events, uh, I think it goes a long way when you're trying to, you know, play some of the, the stuff in U.S. equities. Yeah, and I think that's an interesting wrinkle that you guys provide that not a lot of the ball managers we track do, that really you play that special situations or, or earnings announcements. And But it, I think it's both a pro and a con, right? Like is, you know, it allows you to play in a um, in a different field than most people because it's capacity constrained. So a lot of like bigger funds or institutional players aren't really going to play in earnings or special situations. But then that also hurts you on the business side that you can't be, you know, 10 billion in AUM. I'm curious how you think about it. Yeah, you know, we're uh <laughs> yeah, 10 million in AU 10 billion in AUM and you're buying wings on uh, you know, earnings. It could definitely be a, a problem, especially if you're trying to spot, you know, positional imbalances with some of the dealers and, and positioning with some of the larger players. Uh but as of right now where we're at, you know, it, it's a very scalable um very scalable strategy and you know, what we're doing as a whole, uh, I think we have a lot of way to scale up. Um, so yeah, you know, maybe, maybe when we get to 10 billion, God willing, <laughs> that'll be a problem. That'll be a good problem to have. Or that part of the book would be a rounding error and you'll forget about it. But, um, <laughs> what do you, what you, you hinted at earlier and, and you brought it up kind of when you're talking about earnings in different sectors, but how do you think differently about, uh, dispersion and correlation, um, uh, than, than typically is assessed? Yeah. So I think, you know, when you're, when you're looking at wings, Right, and you're focused on kurto uh, kurtosis trading. Um, there are different ways that you could look at this because obviously you play, uh, you have a heavier path dependency with the underlying, um, right? It's not your your standard uh, one to one. Um, but there's many different ways where you know we'll look at uh, a specific environment. We'll look at the way how something acted in an environment, and you know we like to break up. Uh, the environments and, and kind of assess it individually. And, you know, at prior shops, this is one thing that I was, uh, I would, I would do very frequently is I would break up certain things into regimes. Like example could be a VIX regime where you have, you know, a low vol regime, medium vol regime, high vol regime. Uh, and then you analyze how some of the factors have acted in that regime in relation to a specific shock, right? So the same way how you would shock your book, you know, in a, in a specific scenario analysis, you could do that, right, and vice versa. Now, it's hard to do this when you're focused on outlier events, right, because there's statistically there's so little of them. Um, I can't give you a great uh, understanding. But I think when you couple these things with also understanding, okay, who are the main participants in this market, um, you know, or in this specific sector? How are they looking at risk in this sector? What are some of the uh, moving parts that they may have, right? Who is who is the main participant that's playing this thing, right? A person who uh, is selling vol, uh, you know, on HYG is going to be different from a market participant 
who is selling vol on, I don't know, like Apple, right? It's two completely different things. Uh, it's a, it's a very hard question to answer because you have to have many different ways to kind of look at the book as a whole, to give you that conviction, uh, to say that, Hey, in a real risk off scenario, the beta on this would be heavier, right? And correlations on this would move, you know, more in line than as opposed to, you know, stock B or, or sector B. So you do think about it more like statistical correlations don't uphold when you're doing phase shift or extreme environments. So it's much more philosophical or the art of thinking about how your book combines at different correlations at different, you know, different, like you said, ball regimes, whether it's, you know, short, medium or, or high volatility. Um, and, and then, yeah, I'm curious, like how you would then look at that. Cause you can't really assess that mathematically. If you're, if you're almost like you can shock test it, but there's not really, you're using a, a past history of shock tests, right? In right. Exactly. Yeah. In the past, exactly. Mm-hmm. But like it, if the market changes, how do you think about, yeah, how you align the, your whole book? And do you just go at the end of the day, all the correlations are one and I'm, I'm deal it that way. That's my max risk. And then I, I believe the correlations are different in a, in a, in a mild environment or how do you think about it? Yeah. Again, you know, you don't want to statically just frame your thought process to one way of thinking, right? Because I think it could lead you down the wrong path, especially when you're focused on something that, again, when you're playing wings, it's so path dependent. Um, and you know, when you're assessing something like you know, dispersion and correlation in risk off environments, it could be really hard to try to make that assumption based. I think it's important to have that trader's discretion to understand, you know, the market that we're in. And an example would be like, you know, look at the dollar right now. Everybody is short the dollar, right? And people are saying, you know, synthetically the dollar only has one way to go. Fine, I get it, right? But you have to factor that in that the entire street is short the dollar, right? If you're looking at some sort of correlation with the dollar and the way our equities act, whatever it is, right? If I just took that data and I just looked at it statically and compared, you know, this environment to a prior environment or something like that, how, you know, the dollar acted in, you know, 2015 Brexit or something like that, it's not going to give me a correct way that I should be thinking about it when today everybody's short the dollar. Right. So could there be a cascading effect if for some reason the dollar spikes overnight? Right. Maybe there's some sort of governmental intervention that will you know, go against it. But I have to be thinking about some of these moving factors. Again, who are the participants in this market? Why are they participating in you know, this market? For what reason? Uh, and just kind of combining all those things. So this is why I say, you know, we we do things from a quantitative perspective. But we do have a heavy discretionary overlay because I think that's where you have the beauty of two, of where you have that quantitative ability and then the discretionary side matches it. And it's like you have the best of both worlds and now you could actively act as a practitioner. I don't think in this market things can be done completely discretionary or completely quantitatively. I think there needs to be a balance uh, between the two, you know, from a practitioner standpoint to say, hey, this doesn't make sense. Okay. Why doesn't it make sense? Because I have this, this, and the third. I may not be able to explain it mathematically, but I could tell you what is actually going on. You know? Well, I think that's, you know, we've talked about this a million times and we think about it often is, you know, as originally humans, then we went to machines and we thought that was the end all be all, but now it's human plus machine is really the future. Cause like you said, it's the creativity of thinking outside of the algorithms or your back test of what could happen in, in unique markets as they change and undulate throughout the years. It's like, you have to have that creativity of the human to figure out just something doesn't feel right here. And you get that gut feel or that finger feel through experience. But speaking of that, like discretionary, you know, the hardest part on options, especially buying wings is like, how and when do you monetize? And so do you guys have some kind of mechanical heuristics or is it all dealer's choice, discretionary, you know, this feels good, time to sell? Yeah, so this is a, this is the beautiful part. Um, I We don't believe in quantifying the monetization process for the outlier events. Uh, we think that that's where your discretion as a trader really needs to step in, you know, because, and, and the you know, if you look at the way how we structure the book, as I said, we're cap short Vega, but we're uncapped long Vega, right? So we want that outcome of, you know, the Six Sigma event or whatnot to take place. We don't want to cap that where, you know, we're long, uh, let's just say a call spread, right? We don't want that to be capped. We want that to go as far as possible. And we want our discretion to look at that and say, okay, what is going on in this environment right now? 
um, that will aid our conviction or remove our conviction because you cannot quantify outlier events, right? So imagine, you know, I'm trying to quantify a monetization process around the VIX. I, it, it can't be done, right? If you were trying to do that prior to COVID, you lost it. You missed out on a lot of money, right? You were monetizing too early, right? It takes that understanding of being a trader and kind of being in the trenches a little bit to say, okay, hold on now. You know, this fund, you know, is, is under pressure right now. There's a lot of selling pressure that's going on. Liquidity looks really dry right now. Um, you know, this person is, is, you know, we're hearing from this bank that, you know, they're unloading a lot of size. We're seeing this, this amount of size pop up on, you know, level two, level three. It's ways of understanding that, you know, or, or, you know, we get to a certain level and, you know, we see uh, additional flow coming from, you know, a, a certain, uh, certain market maker. I think it's a lot of forms of experience that comes with the monetization process. Um, you know, especially when you're long fall, I just don't think that systematically it's the correct way of doing things. Now, I think on the shortfall side, you can do that. You can have a systematic way where you're like, okay, yeah, exit here, we're done. Um, but on the long fall side, I feel like you kind of have to be out there scoping it and, and seeing, does this make sense? Does it not make sense? You know, should we get out now? Should we not get out now? What is the reason that's aiding or removing our conviction? Um, and that will just need to be, you know, the trader's discretion with them assessing the environment and assessing where flows are at. Well, then also with one month in on most of your options, you also have that, that, that time as a sharp stick at your back too, that that's going to get you out of the trade no matter what too, even if you, if you, even if you held on longer, well, it's always there. Yeah. Well, here's the, here's the thing about the way how we look to monetize. We do it in tiers, right? And this just goes down to like, trading 101 just being like a, a you know a decent trader uh you know like how the old this is important guys yeah. in the used to trade where it's like okay you have a position where you've now made you know 200 percent. you lock in a quarter of that position right you, you sell some delta against that right and then you assess okay here we are now i'm up you know let's say a thousand percent i sell some more against it Right. And then you keep, you know, let's say a fourth of a lot or a third of a lot and you let it ride out. Right. You have to monetize in tears. And that's where, again, our discretion comes in, um, where it's like we notice that we have something and we and this is how we always trade immediately when the trade works in our favor. We complete something where we call it paying for the trade. So now we're correct. We're going to make sure no matter what, this is a free trade. We are not losing on this trade. We may give up a lot of gains because the trade may go against us. but there is no way that we're coming out losing on the trade. You know, if, let's just say we paid whatever amount, X amount of dollars, let's just say, you know, $15,000 for wings, right? You paid $15,000 for wings one way. The moment that that trade works in our favor and we could cover the cost, we're going to remove that. So we're taking some off, we'll ride out the, the remaining two thirds or, you know, the, the final one third, because uh, it stretches it out. You know, it gives you a good frame and a good thought process on how to monetize and, also, you know, how to keep, keep uh, your head on your shoulders because you don't want your, uh, your emotional discretion to, to kind of take, uh, take hold of you. Right. Because now let's say if you're up a thousand percent and it goes down, you know, 200%. Now you're like, Oh yeah, I'm getting out. I'm getting out. Right. You have to pay yourself along the way. Yeah. So you, you're saying you need to be able to sleep at night to be able to trade well. So you need to maybe take some of that position off. Um, you mentioned something that I always find fascinating. Um, you said if vol is rich, right? And people can say vol is rich or cheap, but it's interesting. There is no real definition for rich or cheap. It's really individual and subjective. So I'm curious how you think about rich or cheap. Does that really just come from gut feel from experience? No, I think there's a lot of metrics that you need to use to look uh, look at it. So what we do is we we do different look back periods. So like, let's just say we're just doing a basic form of analyzing skew. You know, let's just say you're you're taking the uh, ten delta put, all right, dividing it by uh, the uh, fifty delta put, right, and you're just looking at that on a historical look back, right different forms of historical look backs again that i think you should do you know you should do a, a six month look back one year look back three year look back five year look back right and you know it gauges your understanding and you know you could kind of uh, mold that into your model which the way how you feel best as, as i said you know we specifically give a heavier weighting to the the uh the, the more recent stuff due to the changing market microstructure but you know there's a lot of different ways that you could go about assessing 
what is rich, what is cheap. Um, and, you know, maybe the tails uh, are dirt cheap, but maybe it, it, it's seeming that way because of the ratio that you ran. But, uh, you know, un, unknowingly, the entire term structure is lifted up, right? So it technically isn't that cheap. It's just that, right, the ratio that you're running between that 10 delta to the 50 delta, right, on the look back period is saying, hey, that's cheap. When you look at the overall term structure, the term structure is up, you know, 400 vols, which again, you know, here's another form that you have to analyze when you're looking at that. You need to look at the, the entirety of the term structure and a look back on that. So it's taking all these different pieces and analyzing it. And, you know, it's, it's, um, it's all subjective. I, I think, you know, the way how I look at skew and the way I, I may look to, to price skew or look at che- skew is uh, rich or cheap is definitely different from the way how a lot of other practitioners do it. Um, so it all comes down to, you know, what you're trying to accomplish and you know, the way how, like, I don't even look at, like, I don't pay attention to anything like six month ball, you know, like people, people talk to me about things about, you know, the end of the term structure. And I'm just like, unless it's VIX, VIX is a completely different story. I'm, I'm always looking at that term structure, but like for SPX, like, you know, and, you know, some of the other stuff or single names, like I don't really care too much about it. And throughout this conversation, kind of around the periphery, we've been talking on flows here and there. And so the question we get really often actually is like, you know, when we talk to people like like you or other, you know, former market makers, et cetera, they're always talking about, you know, how do these guys get access to these flows? What are they looking at for flows? And so, you know, it's really like you're looking at level two or level three order book. You're looking at like maybe block trades might tip you off that this is a non-economic hedger. Then you're talking to other people on the street and Bloomberg chat. Like, how do you think about, and you, you built up these relationships over years or sometimes decades for others. It's like, it's a combination of all these things and it, it really isn't, there's not retail access to that. Or how do you, how do you think about putting that together to get a feel for how the, where the flows are and, and where those, like you said, those positional, um, you know, the positional players are to, to think about your chaos theory again. Right, exactly. And I think that's a very fair point. You know, it's, uh, we've definitely built up uh, a lot of relationships, my partners and I, um, right. So we, we talk to people, we have certain uh, institutions that cover us, right. We're, we're, we're talking to people on the street as things are going on. So we definitely do have uh, an edge from, from that standpoint. Um, you know, the way how I think uh, retail should look at it, um, you know, it boils down to more so, I mean, you have access to, to level two trading and, you know, you could see things that, that printed on the tape and, you know, what you could synthetically do is just try to recalibrate the vols and, you know, for, for a term structure and say, okay, you know, this printed at this specific level here, you know, the rate of the change of the vol was pretty big. I know that there could be, you know, a potential dealer that's, uh, you know, under pressure at this level or something of that sort, right? You could look at the way how the term structure changes, the rate of change in the term structure. I think all those little things could give you a, a good idea or, or like, let's just say, you know, you notice uh, a, a very big bidder um, that's coming on or around like, you know, midday in a specific name and you know they're printing on the tape midday for the last like four days well that's probably somebody that's getting filled on an order or you know you look at some of the prints that's taking place on vwap you notice that somebody's you know soaking on vwap okay that's a big institutional order or something i mean you have to i think you have to play the game for a little while to have this sort of intuition and this understanding right you you can't just like pick up a book and just figure these things out like nobody's going to show you these things like that way um but after a while, you know, you could make some assumptions on it. It's, it's tough. It's very tough, I think, when you're not an institutional player to try to make these sort of assumptions. Um, but I think you need to have at least some sort of a, a hypothesis on, you know, what's going on and, and why that's, this is taking place. Again, you know, if you notice a huge dislocation in the way how, you know, the 80% moneyness you know, has changed on the smile. Maybe you said, wow, that's jumped, you know, 20 vols overnight. Okay. What's the reason? Can you go back and look, let me see what hit the tape. Then you see a huge order, you know, that came in, somebody just bid up a bunch of puts down there, right. Or they've been bidding up the puts, you know, for the last uh, 10 days, right. That's going to give you understanding that, okay, there's a dislocation there. You know, how can I take advantage of it? You know, you could form this creative way of thinking on, how, you know, if I see this again in this specific name, because again, you know, you have to think of that. A lot of players that have these sort of mandates play specific names. 
So you'll have like a, you know, um, a fund that will only be buying downside fall in healthcare names or, you know, bank names, right? So maybe you spotted that in JP Morgan, you've seen, okay, this hit the tape, you know, for the fifth day in a row. Uh, is there a way for me to take advantage of that? Maybe I should be buying that because, you know, these guys are probably going to come up, push the balls up even more, uh, you know, especially around earnings time. Maybe they, you know, they're always buying uh, protection during earnings time. It's hard to put these things together from a retail standpoint, but I think you have to be in the weeds a little bit uh, to, to make a little bit of a discretionary call on it. So I was thinking about it earlier today, like when you were saying Phoenix auto callables and stuff, and it started relating in my mind of actually sports betting, which you and I have talked about a lot privately, whether, you know, it's, it's parlaying or hedging or even in-game wagering and how just general mathematical minds work in general. And, and then both of you and I have a, a history of every once in a while doing a little bit of card counting here and there, always trying to find that edge. Um, but I also learned today about your, your, your short history as a chess champion and, and, uh, <laughs> people have to find that on Twitter if they want to learn more about that. Uh, but what I think about often is like uh, us long ball guys in general are pretty quirky. But and so if you're always looking for long volatility in the markets, I wonder why do all of us maybe sometimes <laughs> search out short volatility outside the markets? Like I think Ben Eifert's trying to get Rabdo on his Peloton, right? Veneer Bonsali is hella skiing. Chris Cole is is rock climbing, and and you like to. Uh, you like to wrestle in skin tight clothes with sweaty men and try to choke each other to death. So, you know, how do you think about short volatility in your personal life when you really got that long volatility on your books? Yeah, that's really funny. So for the viewers who are listening and don't know uh, anything about me, I enjoy, uh, I enjoy boxing and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And I'm very fortunate enough to, uh, to express these, these interests with a lot of guys who are very good in the space. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, that's a really good question, but there are some times where you have to just remove that way of thinking and just do what you enjoy, you know, like, sure. That is a short vol trade where, you know, um, for, for guys that don't know, you know, some of the guys I train with actually fight in the UFC, which is really cool. Right. And there's not too many guys who could say, Hey, I train with guys who legitimately fight in the UFC, but you know, I could hit my head and something bad could happen. Right. And, you know, it could, it could be a bad cause. So of course there, it is a short ball trade, but there are times in life where, you know, I, th I think you have to do what, what makes you happy. You know, you have to, you have to fill up that, that happiness monitor in your heart. Um, and sometimes the short trade, the, the short ball trade is, is, is the trade that makes you happy where you're looking at that, um, you know, that, that UVXY call and you're saying, wow, that's some juicy premium there. I'm going to sell that naked. Uh, so I think everybody has that, that, that side to them as long fall. I think long fall guys naturally are, are risk focused guys who think about things in, you know, positive payoffs, but also look for a form of excitement. I think all of us look for a form of excitement in life. Um, you know, it's, it's exciting when the ball is going, it's exciting when, you know, that PNL is moving the way out. It is, it's exciting to play this game. Uh, so yeah, I think at the end of the day, you got to do things that make you happy. Well, in your defense, you do have a monk like discipline with both your diet, your weightlifting, your exercise, your sleep, regimen, you know, and all of that is to make sure you can sit in that chair and focus for hours and hours on end. So you do have to blow off a little steam and I'm sure, you know, rolling al allows you to get some of that steam out, of, uh, you know, from the market. So once again, I appreciate you coming on the podcast and I, I look forward to doing this again. And uh, one day I'm going to teach you actually how to text instead of using voice. Or maybe I'm the old man that you're going to teach me how to voice text instead of using my, my fat thumbs. But thanks again, Chris. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate you. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, we'd appreciate if you would share this show with friends and leave us a review on iTunes as it helps more listeners find the show and join our amazing community. To those of you who already shared or left a review, thank you very sincerely. It does mean a lot to us. If you'd like more information about Mutiny Fund, you can go to mutinyfund.com. For any thoughts on how we can improve the show or questions about anything we've talked about here on the podcast today, drop us a message via email. I'm taylor at mutinyfund.com and jason is jason at mutinyfund.com. Or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at Taylor Pearson ME and Jason is at Jason Mutiny. To hear about new episodes or get our monthly newsletter with reading recommendations, sign up at mutinyfund.com newsletter.